Mike. Um, so uh, just to, since I have the full five minutes, just kind of recap why uh, we're, why we're doing Medi Mediverse and what Mediverse app is. Um, so coming into this space, it's kind of difficult to understand what all the different projects are in blockchain. There's no clear aggregation of all the different projects. So the thought is create uh, an overview for all the different projects and give the project teams the ability to kind of update their project as, uh, as they're going on and the, for the user to be able to search, filter, and see all the different projects, have collaboration opportunities between projects, and kind of align the industry on, uh, on regulation. So let me share my screen. And I'll kind of give a, a quick uh, overview of uh, the development of Mediverse. Since we mentioned this a few times, we just launched the, the beta um, over the weekend. So we are now live, anybody who wants to go to uh, manyverseapp.com. Can everyone see my screen? Awesome. So uh, again, it's um, any kind of blockchain or Web3 projects in healthcare and science. Uh, you come to a uh, home screen and then you can search for anything that you want, the organization, project, technology, uh, anything you want. If we search for something like who's using Ethereum, you can see all the different projects that come up. Um, you can also do the different formation type, what sector of the healthcare industry is a project claimed or not claimed, meaning have we made the update or has a project team, uh, team made it, what kind of status it is. Um, so let's go look at one of these. Uh, Bio that actually just created their project the other day. So it goes into a few tabs. You can see what kind of organization, again, what sector it is. You can visit their uh, website, white paper added to your list, and this gives you an overview of what is the use case, their methodology, their mission, basically an overview of the, the project. Um, and then if you're interested in um, working with the team, you can see the, the collaboration opportunities that they have here. You can apply to join and contact the team, or you can find out a way to support them. You can see the different projects that are related. So in the sector, if they have multiple projects for the team, uh, any kind of results and links, they didn't actually put any in here, but if they have anything, so what is their latest announcements or anything else that they could they could put here and then the ability to claim, claim their project. Um, the thought behind this is eventually we'll have enough in here that project teams will want to start claiming it will help incentivize them to claim it. And then we could have other materials uh, as well. I'm thinking I'd like to do something uh, with regulation to help out uh, regulation in the field, both understand it and have a spot for regulators to go and kind of find out more about what's going on. Uh, I work for a, a large pharma company. Um, if I'm just in, if I'm just in like a department managing projects, I could come here and kind of learn learn more about about the industry. Uh, we have some industry news, which I steal here from uh, Mike since he does such a good job at putting this all together, uh, and then recommended con content. And I see on the list that Mike had put um, the decentralized science wiki on there, um, so I've met with with that team and hopefully transition some of that wiki over to many of our staff and have a, a little bit more user-friendly version. So I'll stop there, see if there's any uh, questions or, uh, or thoughts on it. I mean, I think this is awesome, uh, uh, Mike, because um, I'm endlessly trawling through websites or Twitter <laughs> to find out what projects uh, there are. So it's good to have something uh, uh, so how, how, what made you what made you do this? Is it because uh, there was a lack of it in, 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 uh, in the industry, ex I guess? The exact thing, experience you had, I was trolling through Twitter trying to find yeah. out projects. Um, I kept yeah. looking for it and I was like, well, I'll just, I'll spend a few months building it. Uh, and now, now that it's built, I'm going to spend a few months kind of seeing if it gets populated, if it gets used. Um, if so, I'll continue. Um, if not, I'll kind of just kind of let it go. But I think it's something that's that could be valuable. So so trying it out. Yeah, for sure. So I mean, I think it looks great, man. Oh, thank Sorry. you. I appreciate it.
Sorry, something just popped in my head, Mike. I don't know if you connect with Tori Sanaj from Blockchain Healthcare Today. Um, she has peer-reviewed research journals that come out often, and we're showcasing two today um, that are part of the agenda here, but uh, could be another pointer system where if someone wanted to peer review and you create a pointer system for it, it could be another feature yeah. added to Metaverse app. Um, who is that again? I will definitely Tori Sanaj, I'll put her name in the chat. Um, she's fairly active to connect on LinkedIn. Uh, I'll ask her if she's okay sharing her email too, but that is her name. Awesome. Yeah, let me know if the uh, email, otherwise I can probably just find her with the, with the name that you put in the chat. Yeah, and the, and the British Blockchain Association, the JBBA would probably be very interested in something like this too. So, uh, um, oh God, Nassim is his name who runs that. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I have to think, I, have to figure, I forget his last name, but I can put it in the chat in a little bit too. Um, yeah, that'd be great. And then uh, Bill, I'd ask if there's any criteria for something that can be considered for inclusion into the Metaverse app. Um, my only thing is if it's a Web3 bl blockchain and within the, the healthcare space in somewhere that could be researched directly into healthcare. So there's some kind of loose criteria, nothing to, uh, too stringent. So if you want to put your eyeglass where that's company, that's absolutely something you can do. Awesome. Any more feedback for Mike Pika? Daniela, please. Hey, Mike. Pika, not Mike McCoy. <laughs> Mike P. Uh, this is awesome. Um, we're, we would have, and for those of you who don't know, I'm Daniela Barbosa. I'm part of the Hyperledger team. Um, if uh, we'd be happy to help promote uh, this through our healthcare members and just people in our ecosystem as well. So I'll take a look at it. Um, Mike, if you can just uh, give me your email address, um, I'll connect with you offline and see how we can awesome. help promote this. It's great stuff. Yeah. I'll throw it in the, the chat right now. That way, if anybody else wants to contact me, they can as well. Mike Pika is our MVP when it comes to uh, healthcare SIG, our most valuable Pika. So we, uh, we love <laughs> nice. him coming every week. Awesome, cool. We'll get into the industry news stuff now, unless there's anything else anyone else wants to mention. Oh, I did want to highlight uh, an upcoming event. So tomorrow on Twitter Spaces, that's pretty much Clubhouse for Twitter, uh, at 10 a.m. Eastern, uh, there's a group uh, called Web3 Women in Science. It's from it's a collaboration of a lot of people that are part of the DSI movement now, as well as some that are just working in healthcare in general, and that want to be able to democratize access to funding and data and information when it comes to science. So uh, a great group of women that are going together in that space tomorrow, 10 a.m. Eastern. I highly encourage wherever you are in the world, please give it a listen. Maybe you're doing heads down time or something or whatever, but uh, I really want to support that group. They all are brilliant. They do so much for so many people in the space. Give it a listen if you have the time to do so. Um, and then today we have the MicroStrategy um, World Conference. Uh, they have their healthcare track going on today. I believe it's going on this morning, actually. Um, so give that a, a listen. And then uh, there's other events I have to add on here. Actually, is anyone going to Eat Denver? I might actually make the trip uh, and take some PTO and just head over to Eat Denver. So let me know if you're going uh, or not. Um, hey, Mike, it's Erica. I'll be there. Um, yeah, yeah, I'll be there. I just joined a DAO called Metagamma Delta, and we'll be. I'll be representing them, and I'll be there. It's my like fourth year attending, so yay! I'd be so excited if you came. That's awesome. What days? Like, all right, just generally speaking, what days should I go? Is it the first half of the week or the second half? Like, I it's no. Everything is on Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Usually, like all of the presentations and the parties and all the like real engagement ah. at the end of the week and of course i already have a ski trip towards the latter half of the week and weekend where i'm like ah darn it'll be really tough to do both but um uh, is it here or, or no it's in oh. the boring new york areas and mountains not the very great mountains you actually have out in colorado um so yeah a little bit of conflict socially but. oh man well regardless let me know if you come out Yes, I will have to. I will have to hold you to that. We do need to meet in person for the first time. So we do. We do. And I've never met Wendy in person. I've had like probably oh. two hundred calls with Wendy in my lifetime, and I've never met her in person either. So we yeah. will get Wendy with us, and we'll all get together. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, let's get into these topics. Um, so one, one to highlight uh, for everyone: the DSI Wiki. I find this. I check this at least like two, three times a week. Like there's new updates of different things coming onto it. 
but it shows all these different DAO projects, not only the ones that Molecule and their team are, are creating, but um, Open Science DAO, Lab DAO, Genomes DAO. Genomes was genome.io. They didn't ICO raise back in the day, but then they gave the money back and now they're creating a DAO to be able to uh, utilize your DNA in like a bank in a decentralized community. Research Hub, who we've highlighted and presented here before. So, SciDAO, that's the um, Molecule one, but tons of DAOs, tons of projects on here. I highly suggest going through these and uh, and giving them a read. There's also tons of informational articles, like intros to what DSI truly is, uh, a whole bunch of things, IP NFTs and what that concept is. So definitely give it a read, definitely give it a, a reference and uh, I find it highly useful. Um, next up, uh, so has anyone else used the DSI wiki besides Mike? Mike mentioned he has, but um, anyone else? Have they given it a look before? All right, good, it's informational. You can check it out now. All right, uh, it was hot off the presses yesterday. Blockchain Healthcare Today came out with a 2022 predictions uh, article for say editorial with, um, <laughs> I think it was one or two authors. And as that's loading, it's coming up. But uh, the, the, the predictions were kind of interesting. My computer wouldn't be so slow. Yeah, it was from members of um, University of Arkansas, people from Avenir, and a pretty diverse group in particular. So uh, a lot of it's editorial, but in particular, uh, they talked about interop layers, connection of internet and medical things, um, distributed files and replicated file systems, as well as the expansion of 5G networks within uh, blockchain technology. So they kind of all gave their, their puts and their opinions on the topic and fire integrations and, and all these other things. Um, was everyone, anyone else able to give this a read and, and do they have any, um, any type of uh, opinion on it? Cool. It was also a, a motivational thing to get you to go to Combi 2X, the symposium that releases in November. And uh, yeah, as a decent overview. Uh, moving on, there was a lot of information coming out of the Chronicle team, and in particular with the Meta Ledger Consortia. So, one, they came out with the beginning of the week with their 2021 kind of annual report, and it gave a lot of uh, detailed stories and like customer client success stories and um i thought it was highly informational so if anyone has questions of like they hear about chronicle they hear about meta ledger and they want to learn more this is a very good detailed report on how and where to potentially partner or work with them but they also had some great news uh, coming out so in the kind of web3 more decentralized protocol news they partnered up with parity technologies so parity technologies uh they are the company that uh creates god i'm not thinking of the protocols right now uh the two protocols they do are polka dot and substrate yeah sorry uh they're going to potentially leverage them for peer-to-peer -peer communication when it comes to chargebacks from consumers with life science products that they uh interact with and sorry my computer is so dang slow right now but uh that partnership is going to be very interested so mental ledger was developed using Parity's original blockchain framework substrate that now also powers Polkadot due to those relationships. So it's kind of more like an update, but they're saying at some point they want to be able to peg uh, pricing discounted or um, sorry, pricing reconciliation data into a public record to showcase that to consumers for more tr price transparency, which I'm excited about. I think a lot of us are as just general like healthcare consumers. Um, but obviously the, the, the complexity, the, the technology behind that is going to be a never changing thing. So um, yeah, did anyone uh, give this a read per se? Any opinions on it? I, I mean, do, do they have a network effect? Are they, are they growing? Are they having a kind of an exponential 
so on doing, their network. So right now they're kind of creating federated network partnerships where yeah. like they're adding in one member at a time to then make sure yeah. that the group in the consortia agrees with adding that same member into it. And then they come into mm. this private blockchain network. They don't have an open blockchain network now. They're, they okay. use a private parity method or sorry, private um, substrate as their like blockchain. A Okay. Yeah, it's just okay. like it's like Hyperledger uh, per se. Um, yeah. But at some point, they want to be able to showcase price transparency in new and future offerings. Um, they're just they'd have to get the whole private consortia then to agree upon publicly hashing and showing maybe accuracy scores or specific prices mm -hmm. for certain pharmaceuticals, or most likely how many times they were able to save money on chargebacks and other details and information that can be released okay. so that's more or less yeah. the goal I'll, I'll definitely check out the report thanks mike I, I mean with all these kind of DAOs and things um it's interesting to see what their governance setups are um and and how they actually get those together and what they look like in real life um because um that's that's uh, like it's taken a bit of a bit of a time for for pharma ledger to kind of get that going and it's it's I mean, I think in the industry, I, I've underestimated how slow things <laughs> take to get going, um, but uh, but we're getting there. So yeah, I'll, I'll, um, I'll I think they have touched base um, with uh, uh, my superiors. They, there was a call like a couple of weeks ago. So I, I I don't know what's happening in terms of both both the projects, whether it's going to be a collaboration or anything like that. But um, yeah, I'll definitely check out the report. Thank you. Absolutely, Daniela, did you have a comment that you wanted to mention? Oh no, I lower my hand. Sorry. Ah. It was up from before. I apologize, Mike. Just imagine if you were holding that for 15 minutes, you'd be so tired. Well, you have. Oh, you shoulders. didn't you didn't know me in fourth grade. <laughs> <laughs> I was an annoying kid that did the same thing. Every single question, or raise my hand, tried to be the fastest one all the time. I was annoying. So that's awesome. All right, and then the, the last one I wanted to share in particular, the Chronicle, they, they added Amici Pharmaceutical as a new MetaLedger consortium partner as well, kind of similar to what I mentioned about the federated one-to-one -one relationships and how they're going into that. So uh, very interesting stuff. One of the more interesting, uh, I guess, like public relative findings I found this week was with the University of Arkansas showcasing uh, their pilot of using a self-sovereign identity for a digital staff passport at the UK National Health Service. Uh, so one, the UK has endorsed a separate service, which is using blockchain for government documentation validation. But then, and yet I will preface that NHS in the UK has not endorsed this method. This is just purely pilot and experimental. They have not endorsed and said this will be implemented per se within the NHS, but they gave uh, a, a good framework into the principles, the different methods, uh, how and what to build to trust and kind of uh, talked about using an Evernim system and, and using, I believe they said it was India Aries Ursa on here as well um, and, and following sovereign network principles to be able to conduct this experiment. The experiment is a little, uh, one would, could say outdated towards newer uh, I did or SSI technologies that are out there, but uh, they were finally able to publish the report and get it out to everybody uh, to showcase it, one, for a COVID-19 passport, as well as to uh, just use a blockchain to verify a physician's uh, credentials within NHS and the government entity. We're all familiar with ProCredX in particular, it's based in the United States, that produces a very similar method. Um, this is just how the NHS government could be able to utilize it as well. Just just uh, another comment. Sorry, I, keep, I feel like I'm talking too much on the call. You're uh, not, you're not. Uh, okay, okay. So, so basically, um, when, you, when you work uh, as a doctor in the National Health Service, if you do a, uh, like a training program, for example, acute medicine, that means you have to rotate every like three months. And so what happens is you have to do your exams and depending on how well you do on your exams, you have set uh, regions where you can uh, apply, um, uh, depending on how good uh, the hospital or the infrastructure or the hospital trust is in that regard. But that means you have to then uh, do an induction 
every single time you change your job. And the, in the induction takes uh, almost a week and a half. You have to go through fire and safety. You have to then, uh, you know, how to pick up large objects with not hurting your back, just basic stuff. But with all your medical credentials, right now, um, when I was working as a doctor, the only way to kind of verify those credentials was to have them in a big portfolio uh, and they were paper and you literally lug this thing around uh, growing your portfolio every, everywhere you go. So it's, it's definitely needed. Like the, the infrastructure, I know this sounds amazing, but some of the infrastructure in the NHS, um, it's, um, it's quite archaic. Um, when I was walking, uh, working as a trauma orthopedic doctor, um, you know, we were using fax machines, we're using bleeps. Um, and so um, the NHS uh, England, uh, NHS Digital, uh, NHS England have now merged together with, with NHSX and they're basically pushing all their funding because um, they've realized um, due to the backlog, the only way um, they can uh, kind of reduce the backlog through co because of COVID is, is through technology. Um, so I also posted another self-sovereign identity company. They're called True. Um, they're also using Sovereign. Um, and essentially with these networks, um, everything goes through uh, the Royal Mail or the post office. So you need to get your digital passport or your driver license. Um, and so you're going to see, uh, I, I think, by the governmental organizations uh, uh, collaborating through the post office to offer the credential as well as uh, any kind of NHS ID. Um, but yeah, it's it's good to see it happening. But um, on, on the ground level, I, I, I think we've we've probably still got quite a quite a long way to go. But it, it's it's good to see. I, I I did not know this, so thanks for sharing. Of course, there's a guy named Graham, um, you know Philip Graham, I believe, who's part of like uh, a digital innovation group of NHS. I forget the exact name of it. He's the one that's been shepherding and championing these solutions. Uh, awesome. could be a very valuable connection for you. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think, credentialing. well, they're, they're, so, so in terms of timelines, so we demoed the electronic product information uh, use case and uh, to the regulator, which is the MHRA, uh, the Medicines Healthcare Regulatory Authority, sorry. Um, and they've taken five and a half months uh, to get an email back to us to then link us to NHSX. And so then I kind of went straight away. I was like, look, we need to, we need to get in there. And um, I've kind of had a slap on my wrists for acting too, too quickly. And um, so, yeah, if, if you can uh, pop that name in, in, in the chat. Um, yeah. and, and then I'm, I'm probably going to probably connect with him because we've got a call lined up uh, at the end of Feb. So, yeah, fantastic. Thanks for that. Yeah. Yeah, I believe it's Phil Graham. Might be two L's uh, on there, but, you know, just try and trial and error with that. Um, yeah, Philip's great, though. I know. Uh, oh, I was just on mute. <laughs> I, I interacted with Philip two years ago and uh, he's great. Uh, he's been trying to build this within the UK for years now. Um, any other opinions, qu uh, comments, questions on this from anyone? All right, we'll move on. Uh, so I mentioned the government valid doctrine validation technology that is within the UK. So prescriptive health, they are named a consensus, consensus AG, not consensus health or equidium, uh, a consensus premier partner uh, utilizing Quorum as a blockchain service. This is highly interesting. So one, some story behind it, prescriptive health added on an employee named Corey Tadero. Corey Tadero used to be at Digital Asset uh, was kind of leading the product for digital asset when it came to healthcare and using their smart contract modular uh, framework for like business and lay readers to utilize smart contracts easier. I loved Corey and I think he does a great job in the space with anything he does. Now he's part of the prescriptive health team. And now the prescriptive is in a partnership with consensus in particular. Uh, there's going to probably be some really cool things coming along. Uh, so within there, um, prescriptive can place consumers at the center of their health experience by enabling transparency of their health plan data, prescription drug pricing. And it seems like they're trying to make the more like the pharmaceutical data information a utility through prescriptive health and using a quorum blockchain to be able to distribute that utility out to uh, particular partners with individuals and prescribers and uh, pharmacists be able to own the electronic prescriptions for the first time. Uh, daunting task obviously a big ask that we all think is, is very valuable and useful um 
but I'm, I'd love to see the products that come out of this partnership in particular. Uh, so this is separate from Equidium and Consensus Health. Consensus Health is uh, doing and solving different problems, not particularly pharma and pharmacovigilance, but more so on kind of patient ownership of utility and sovereignty there. Um, whereas this would be for pharmaceuticals and, and pharmaceutical manufacturers and partners to be able to utilize it as well. Um, obviously, there's more you can learn from in particular the teams like Corey and Prescriptive and Tony Little, who's the vice president of product at Prescriptive as well. Um, but uh, yeah, that's uh, great news to hear. Anyone else have a comment or opinion on it? Uh, more of a question, would this uh, take into account like insurance and everything as well? I'm not sure. So that's a question I obviously have. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, uh, I'm planning to meet with Corey soon on it. So, um, so yeah, this, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'd be interested to see how the insurance companies kind of react to the, the transparency because we're interested in that. Yeah. Well, I assume like the prescription drug pricing, like obviously that'll affect the, the health plan too. So, I mean, if they're trying mm -hmm. to create transparency control of health plan data, they must have particular potential partnerships involved with that or are aiming for that. And also like the standard to become a premier partner in particular, I think it's like you pay, I don't know, 15 to 25,000 a year to utilize quorum blockchain service, like 24 seven support, uh, specific features that consensus will provide you. Um, and that support, that consensus support team's top notch. I used to be connected with a lot of those teams. So it's good service. It seems they already have a app in particular to connect in this through myrx.io. I haven't checked out myrx.io, but it could be something to look into. All right, uh, we'll move on. Uh, and I said the University of Arkansas research was very beneficial, but I thought this was probably the most beneficial. SRI International in partnership with the Department of Homeland Security in the United States and the specific department within the Department of Homeland Security called the Silicon Valley Innovation Program <laughs> showcased this research that was originally uh, written in October, oh, sorry. That was originally written in October of 2020, but was released uh, this past week in particular. Um, you have to download the link from Anil John. Anil John is part of the uh, DHS Silicon Valley Innovation Program. Uh, of what they found in creating an SSI technology stack that could be utilized within government that meets FISMA and NIST uh, standards in particular. And I loved every second of reading this report. So um, if, can everyone see this, by the way? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, some of the, what was the one I wanted to highlight and show everyone in particular? Um, yeah, they went over like security strength for like bit security. Oh, the hash functions, cryptographic algorithms were interesting. So if I go to five, oh, where was this one? Oh yeah, so they applied like protection, like where and how like, the security strength would last. Like, you know, pretty much like they would say like the security standards that would be acceptable until 2030 and 2031 and beyond, they would give you like criteria of whether that would work or not. It just gave so much clarity in particular of like what algorithms, what protocols, what hash functions you could be able to use in these uh, in these type of formations and uh, the different cryptographic hash functions uh, like we're all familiar with SHA-256 in particular, but within the SHA-3 family, they gave the particular protocols and things that could connect into that. Um, so personal story for me, uh, the CIO of Philadelphia is exploring a lot of uh, blockchain and crypto use cases in particular, he wants to use SSI for like small business certifications and validation. Uh, we are actually on the side looking at these uh, protocols and features to utilize for doing that in the city of Philadelphia. And he, he found this to be extremely helpful when it came to building the architecture and other things within this, as well as like block ciphers and what to utilize there. And this is a highly technical document, but really gets to the heart of how and what to actually build for a W3C uh, efficiency and global standard. Um, but yeah, any comments, questions on this in particular?
Um, have they have they stated how they're gonna interact or um, I guess ad- get get the adoption of of the of the of the identity community, like kind of regulatory agency? So where I, I, so, you mentioned yeah, the did but... so the did in particular is like a hash that could be like if you follow the did standard you can tie into any like did title right or like did like id or or framework and it just it's just like a pointer system to other ids that are validated and verified with an issuer holder and verifier in this type of network so in particular like let's just say you created a did in the united states for um, uh, a passport and then i were to go to the uk in particular if they followed a did method as well you could just scan my did qr code and then it would reference to the did kind of like database validate that it meets standards or and follows the proof the proof then says yes or no this person is validated to come to the country it's simple as that rather than actually having to carry like like you mentioned like the medical passport in particular i yeah you wouldn't have to have all the pages of individual has to do that so we're speaking to like gs1 and glide the guys who set the actual kind of kind of standard so i'm just wondering if they've incorporated any anything like that in the paper yeah and gs1 was part of the uh pilot program that the department of homeland security uh created back in two years ago um okay so i'm sure they had a say in the recommendations here uh, how to build it um but for those that want to be technical and want to get oh and also one of the main features we had a an individual named john walker a year ago i believe he might still be part of the linux foundation public health stuff i'm not sure maybe as a contributor um Danielle you could probably verify that for me uh but he he mentioned he's working on the Linux Foundation CCI and the uh, GSNB project um so he is on staff awesome and he gave us a good presentation on BBS plus signatures and schemes that make that more internationally interoperable um to give selective disclosure when a user holds a signature for multiple messages and only shares the signature that's approved upon by uh, the group or the participants in that network. Um, that's the proof point I was saying, uh, Kira, uh, so that um, you can be able to see it. And uh, yeah, like this was just highly informational for me, at least too much to, to cover in just a conversation. But uh, I, I highly encourage anyone that's thinking about DIDs, that's thinking about decentralized identity uh, and wants to be able to have a global representation of it, uh, check out this paper. It's going to really help you out when it comes to your development of things. Any other comments on it or questions on it? Cool. I will move on. So Cardiff Metropolitan University came up with uh, a paper uh, describing sharing to selling challenges and opportunities to establish a digital health data marketplace using blockchain technology. This is more of an overview of specific technologies that was published just yesterday in Blockchain Healthcare Today. Uh, so within the PDF, it, they showcase like, despite the growing use of EHRs by medical practitioners and digital wearable or wearable digital gadgets by individuals, 80% of health and medical data remain unused because of the interact problems and they kind of go over a lot of frameworks uh, for that within this PDF. Was anyone else able to give this a read or um, have any opinions on some of the findings here? I didn't have a chance to read it, Mike, but this is super interesting to me. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, they went into like had DeepMind not initiated for the introduction of GDPR or patients like me were within the European. They were just giving great examples. Technical challenges, data ownership and access control. We're all pretty familiar with that. Uh, gave a pretty decent architecture here of what it would look like. I did, I will admit I didn't go deep into this one as far as, far as the other ones are concerned. But they gave an example of using a DAP, uh, in particular tied to a public Ethereum blockchain and then utilizing IPFS, which is useful. Oh, and using Hyperledger as a composer fabric. Man, I haven't heard about composer in a while. 
Level. It's still out there. Pops up every once in a while. <laughs> yeah. It's not actively maintained. Yeah. Oh, and they showcase med block in here too. That's really cool. <clears throat> yeah, most of the use cases here are great for delegated proof of stake. It's beneficial. But yeah, if you, if you want to learn and, and want to get kind of like a research material on EHR interop, this could be a great reference for you to take, take a look at. I mean, I in particular have spoken with uh, individuals at IPFS and um, they have, uh, they're very interested in like the portability of EMRs and EHRs and would love to propose solutions to like epic centers of the worlds of like how and what they could do for this. I think they just don't have enough healthcare knowledge within the team at IPFS to, to feel confident in a presentation and a potential partnership yet. Um, I have talked to them about shepherding that relationship and seeing what that would look like. But, um, but yeah, there's definitely interest there in those, in those parties and creating these type of models together. So. But I don't, so Mike, that's super interesting. You say that, like, I can't, I can't identify a, an incentive for someone like Epic or Cerner to ever put data on a blockchain. It wouldn't be putting data on a blockchain. It would just make or it not, not, not putting data, but, yeah, but yeah. adopting Web3 technology is what I'm really saying. Like, so there's a couple, like you could probably prove it to them by saying, all right, how many deduplications do we do in the process of reporting to a medical record? Uh, even think about like x-rays per se, right? Like how many times does someone lose like a CD or a floppy disk of an x-ray? But they don't, but, but, but they don't, they don't, why do they care? Well, the doctor cares, the patient cares, right? This is pain for doctors and physicians, but the electronic health record, they like these these big vendors, it doesn't matter to them, right? I, I have a, a, a doubly cynical uh, take on this. I agree with you, Jordan. Uh, the, the modus operandi in healthcare, uh, the prime directive is avoid transparency at all costs. Exactly, 100%. This is, this is not about decentralization per se or any particular efficiency that might come from using blockchain technologies. Um, this is simply uh, the epic model and the, and the business model for their customers is that every day, every morning they get up and figure out how little transparency they can have to whatever they're doing uh, on the business side internally. And the side effect of this is the frustration of the doctors uh, mm -hmm. and the cost mm -hmm. of the systems and the fact that it becomes impossible to tell quality other than by price in healthcare. Uh, you know, you, you're sort of driven to equate uh, value with the cost of something rather than uh, the quality of it, because the quality is never transparent. So anyway, I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, Adrian, Adrian, you, you and I need to uh, have get on a call offline <laughs> and have a conversation together, <laughs> because this is like, this is where I live. I, I'm working for a company right now. We're pivoting. We're, we're going to build a Web3 EHR. And we've, I mean, we, we've just... We understand because we've been building plugins inside Epic's App Orchard, and it became apparent very quickly that Epic has no interest in in fostering any kind of innovation in the healthcare space. They don't want it to change because that's their business model. That's where they're making their money. Just like you said, they're essentially holding data hostage um, to further their business interests at the detriment of doctors burning out and 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 patients receiving the care that they need. And so I think. Um, I, I'd be very interested, Adrian, to continue that conversation with you. Mike, I don't want to hijack this conversation because I can talk about it forever. Uh, but... Gladly. You know how to get in touch with me? Um, I, I, I don't here. Uh, well, maybe drop easy. an email in the chat for me. Yeah, it's just my first initial A, Gropper, uh, whatever shows up in the thing at gmail.com. That will find me. Okay, a perfect. Yeah. Yeah. First off, I, I, we all can agree that, yes, there's not a clear incentive right now for Epic and Cerner and these major EMRs and EHRs to partner and create full web three scenarios where you decentralize ownership of the record, et cetera. But there are ways to convince in experimental methods with these companies that when you do grant ownership and that type of framework to users, that they may be more willing to add information and data. They may be able to like create more like value in marketplaces that they can't even imagine now. And stop the deduplication processes if they have sustainability goals in any of these groups at like Epic or Cerner, right? There are groups and there are people you can convince to become your internal champion to be able to want to build these things is kind of the preference though. Yeah, that's an interesting perspective. 
it's not an easy thing, but it is a like you can't say that it's not an opportunity zone or a green space that that team could explore. It, yeah, there's certainly I agree with you, Mike. There's an opportunity for exploration there, but I will say that we have some history to instruct us a little bit, and that is that you know if you really think about the revolution that happened from Web one to Web two when we moved to platforms and the ability to interact with the web and these and, and data, particularly to foster innovation, uh, EHR is essentially punted, right? I mean, in, in many ways, we, we haven't really, health, healthcare, especially electronic health record vendors, haven't really full, fully made the transition from web one to web two, let alone web two to web three, right? And there was a ton of value in web two that they left on the table because they feared losing market share, right? I mean, you think about, what it, I mean, Epic App Orchard is a is a farce essentially. It, it was a money grab. You can't really innovate there, and they're making money off of a of, of a, a pretended opportunity to develop apps against healthcare data. Um, so anyway, I, interesting perspective. If if I could, uh, if if we have a minute to talk about uh, not uh, EHRs or Epic uh, specifically, but uh, Web three in the context of this group and and how, sure uh, um, so let me be, uh, say two things. First of all, in the did, uh, in the standards work groups, um, did verifiable credentials uh, that, you know, where all this work is being done, the, the web three moniker uh, is being debated um, for any number of reasons, Marlin, uh, Moxie, Mar Marlin Spikes, uh, uh, thing and the response by Vitalik, uh, you know, are, are both worth, uh, well worth reading as an introduction. So uh, that's one thing that's happened in the last week or two. And the second point that I'm curious of, uh, you know, standards come up in this group all the time, and we talked about them again today. And the question I would have for people here uh, as a sort of survey, informal survey, is how do we feel about sectoral standards as opposed to uh, universal standards, right? So a Web3 approach, you know, uh, would be definitely non-sectoral. Uh, you could say that Hyperledger itself, it's not a standard, but is a non-sectoral uh, approach in a very different uh, level. Uh, but my observation is that, for instance, when it comes to blockchain stuff, blockchain practices, uh, you see the finance people are trying to develop their standards and the health people and the uh, identity people, the SSI people are trying to develop parallel standards, not, and, and the IETF people are sort of standing back and saying, well, we're not gonna play this game, but we're not, we're watching. Uh, and so on. So I'm very curious because you guys are all so much more into the business aspects of what's going on, whether this relationship between Web3, and I can mention a lot of standards that are, you know, healthcare exceptionalism, we all know what they look like. Um, I'm very curious about how your projects relate to this question that I just made. In terms of Web3, if you want to be specific, uh, but not necessarily. I will preface by saying the projects I'm a part of are not directly influenced or relevant for Web3. They're more B2B, private permission blockchains. Um, the ones I do personally as a, as a, as a, like the DAOs and the DeFi communities and the things I interact there, like the DeSci wiki groups and whatnot, I'm fairly active in Vita DAO and, and some other ones. Uh, I, I would say that the standards when it comes to interacting and inter interloping with data and, and different claims and whatnot is something that could be highly valuable for these different groups. So, um, I would say to make money on my day job, I don't focus on it at all, but personally I do, so. Um, hi, this is Vasha. So just to go back to the, the previous topic or, or rather the earlier part of the conversation, um, I, I also read the paper and I found it super interesting as well. Um, 
uh, certainly uh, Jordan and uh, Adrian, I don't, I don't disagree with your skepticism around EHRs and and the their lack of incentives um, to share and and you know the the pro incentives to be walled gardens of of data, but. Um, I'm actually really optimistic about changes coming, not because the EHR vendors have, you know, suddenly had a had a change of heart or something, and um, but because I I see a lot of um, the changes that they've been forced to make uh, because the ONC is kind of dragging them, kicking and screaming uh, in that direction. Um, so I wanted to kind of share that where, where I see changes coming is, you know, there's um, October deadlines that are coming really soon. Uh, for EHR vendors to make the USCDI v1 data set available through both patient level and uh, bulk via APIs, um, which I think is is a huge, um, huge area of opportunity for for doing exactly what, um, uh, you know, the, the folks at Cardiff had outlined. Um, but I also think that there are um, further opportunities coming um, in 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 association with the TEFCA and the, and the qualified health networks as well. That's a little bit longer term, but I, I, I do think there's a lot of promise and, and potential and opportunities and I'd love to uh, continue um, talking to anyone who's interested about it. Yeah, Var Varsha, I'd love to connect offline. Um, I'll drop my email in the chat and uh, maybe, maybe we can find a time. Awesome, good. Uh, I do want to like make sure we get through some of these topics just to highlight, and then we can uh, have it as an open quorum. I found an interesting project called Axon DAO. Um, they reached out to me in particular. I just want to know if they're spammy or not, really, because uh, I don't know anyone that's in it. Uh, so this is maybe personal things, but they're creating like the first medical investment DAO. Um, they reached out with a person named Chris. Uh, I don't know if anyone else has interacted with them in particular. It was Chris at AxonDAO.com, and um, yeah, they have big ambitious goals. They're based in Wilmington, North Carolina. And uh, yeah, it was this person. I, I just don't know them yet. Uh, could be something interesting. So uh, wanted to see if anyone else interacts with them, but check them out. Uh, they're fairly active on Twitter and on LinkedIn if you want to interact with them and their project. Uh, based in North Carolina, the United States. Um, Another one that's a Wyoming-based company using smart contracts to authenticate and incentivize healthy choices and behavior of its members uh, called Blue United, another project to check out that I just got a, a Google alert for actually. Um, and they are merging healthcare and blockchain to create, uh, to have smart contracts, authenticate, incentivize healthy choices such as steps and, and certain foods. I don't know how you're gonna verify foods ever, but I think you can verify steps and other sensor tech in this space. Uh, to validate that stuff. So I'd definitely give that a look. There's also a more fun project. <laughs> like uh, I, I joined this thing called Fan Curated Football. And this is American football where it's seven on seven American football and you pay an NFT to be part of this group where you get to be like kind of the general manager and the coach of the team. You, the fans in the community, vote on the plays that the players on the field get to actually do. And like me, who grew up playing Madden NFL, like my whole entire childhood, uh, got really excited about this thing. Um, so uh, and there's also talks that they will connect like wearable data and understand like when certain players have their heart rate, like very excited and very low to like understand like when someone's cool under pressure for the sports and stuff. It's an interesting concept. Uh, I didn't highlight this, but it definitely <laughs> like <laughs> I went down the rabbit hole and like went into their discord and thought it was hilarious. So uh, check it out. If, if fan curated football. Uh, if you want to, yeah, fan creative football, I believe it. Uh, there's another paper that's relevant, uh, Tokenizing Behavior Change, Pathway for Sustainable Development Goals by Frontier. This is a collaboration of a lot of research institutions. Uh, so if you want to think about the behavioral economic incentives when it comes to utilizing these things, I know within gaming blockchains, it's a big thing, but in particular, this could be a huge entity of why to get patients and users to want to validate and use these type of protocols. I found this research to be relevant to help you think and uh, put together the crypto economics and what can be relevant. As well as uh, Insec ID, there's a researcher that just finished his time there with Insec ID, who now is going to Block Daemon, actually, uh, who created a framework to evaluate blockchain interoperability solutions. Uh, he's in Raphael, I believe, and very valuable research. Uh, check it out. Yeah, Raphael. 
uh, based in uh, somewhere in the EU. He's, I forget. He's, in, he's in Portugal. Portugal. Yeah, yeah, he's in Portugal. He's fantastic. He's a lead maintainer on some of our projects. Um, we actually have an interoperability post coming out today that um, he helped author as well. So um, it's coming up in one one hour on the Hyperledger blog. But yeah, Raphael and the team, what they're doing there um, is really great work. Yeah, he's great too. I've, I've, I had a couple of calls with him and he's fantastic to, to riff off ideas with. Um, Vantage Market Research claimed the blockchain healthcare market is going to reach 1.2 billion in 2028. Uh, so if you want to look at market research data, buy their paper there. Um, Consensus Health and a bunch of others came together. I believe Pharma Ledger 2, or no, no. This is highlighting uh, Debbie Bucci being uh, made their chief data officer at Consensus, or sorry, Equidium Health now um to help blockchain is transforming healthcare uh vita dow came up with a discussion panel on the quest to quantify biological aging um a16z had a work of called the future of work is not corporate DAOs and crypto networks here's a bunch of informational kind of like crypto theses and and things to look out for as well as something i wrote called how to DAO with people not just protocols i'm gonna try and write and create everything every two weeks uh that's kind of a personal goal i have for 2022 at something related to blockchain, crypto, healthcare, et cetera. So look out for my content too. Follow that, smash that like button. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, one of those YouTube influencers, but no. Um, tons of Where better. can I pay my subs, Mike? Where can I pay my subs? You're gonna have to get like, a little... Yeah, let's get a lightning channel going. Let's 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 put this out, no, Exactly, exactly. <laughs> No, but uh, tons of promising like material out here for anyone who wants to learn about the space. And also Margareta Colangelo, who's a fantastic researcher, both in like bio, blockchain, AI, found really interesting stats of like who's funding blockchains per se. Um, and like the United States in particular, if you look at this graph, it's kind of wild. Like $11.1 .1 billion has went into blockchain and crypto uh, like projects. And like, Second place is like at I think 1.8. If uh, if I want to go, yeah, Hong Kong is like 1.8, and there might be someone else that's coming. Close. Oh yeah, UK is 1.9, but it's staggering the amount of projects that are based in the US that are uh, raising money for blockchain crypto in particular, and and some of these other hubs. Like I would assume Israel would be higher. France is pretty high. Actually, Paris is a pretty big hub. Uh, Hong Kong definitely. Uh, Singapore I thought would be a little bit higher. Um, but yeah, it was just very interesting to see what projects around the world are getting funded. So uh, we are at time, want to respect everyone's time as well. Uh, are there, is there anything else anyone else wants to mention uh, before we head out? Well, as usual, Mike, my favorite thing to do <laughs> and at 7 a.m. on a Thursday, on a, on a Wednesday. Yes, I mean, for no all our PTers, like thank you very much for, <laughs> for joining us. I know it's way too early. And for anyone else, thank you for joining us uh, for an hour-long informational session on everything blockchain and healthcare. Um, we'll see you in two weeks. Uh, if there's anything else uh, you want to connect or present or showcase to the group, feel free to message me. Like, if you want to be creative and you, you have a project like Metaverse in particular that you want to showcase to others or you even want to showcase your project and updates or things like that. Like, feel free. Like, this is an open community. I don't want it to just have me talking about different things I find in the world uh, in links uh, for every two weeks. But, um, but yeah, please uh, feel free to, to add into the content we do as well. Um, yeah, so that's it. Uh, I appreciate everyone for the time, and uh, we'll see you in two weeks. Thanks, Mike. Nice to meet you. Thanks, Mike. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. Absolutely.